welcoming everybody to our first um, grazing cover crops webinar out of our five part series here. And just thank you for joining us. Thank you, especially to our presenters for their flexibility to adjust their materials to an online format so that we were able to get this out there to people yet. And also we wanna thank the North Central Region SAIR for sponsoring this webinar series. All of our webinars are going to be recorded and will be posted on the NDSU Extension Livestock page under the grazing management topic area. And we'll post that link in the chat box for you as well. Um, with that, I'm gonna introduce our first speaker today, which is, is Marisol Birdie, and she's gonna be talking about cover crop seed regulations. And Marisol is um, our forage research specialist on campus, and is very active in our extension, thankful for us, because we don't have a forage extension specialist. All right, thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us. And um, I wanna mention that um, this project, well, we were supposed to do this workshop in Dickinson a couple of weeks ago, but we couldn't do it. But uh, this project has been funded by North Central STAIR. They're providing the funding for doing these uh, workshops and meetings so we can provide information. And uh, also some of the information shown in the, uh, in the slides also, uh, it's research that has been done by uh, the funding of the USDA NEPA. So I want to make sure you know that. So um, I, you know, it's really nice to see so many people join this and um, I haven't done a webinar before, so I don't know how it's going to go, but <laughs> Mary and Miranda are going to keep me on track. Okay. So I'll, I'll talk for about 20 minutes. We will have the questions to the text box and somebody can read, it, read them to me later uh, so we don't interrupt the, the crop. But you can start writing your questions right away and they'll, they'll, they'll uh, help me with that. <clears throat> okay, so um, so this first topic about cover crop seed regulations and crop, uh, crop variety preservation is, is very important because um, um, in the last two years, since cover crops boomed up and a lot of people are using it, there's been a little bit of confusion of, of what uh, of what we we know about seeds and, and how and make sure we're following all the regulations and laws regarding all the crop seed, which are following exactly the same ones as other crops. Okay. So um, and this is a first important point is that crops seed follow same seed regulations as any other crops. Okay, and there's some differences that it's good to know about these. Um, North Dakota, I have as North Dakota, but each one of you in different states, you have some seed laws in states. So North Dakota seed law requires that all agriculture seed offer for sale or so for planting purposes must be labeled. Okay, um, when I, I quote things directly from the legislator, I don't want to change the words because that's exactly how these are, okay? I'm sure you say you have several similar things. So the important thing is seed by definition is something that is going to be uh, planted, okay? So you buy corn to feed the animals, that's not seed. But if you say to plant it, then it's seed, okay? And any seed that is going to be used for planted must be labeled. Uh, this is very important, the label of seeds that is going to be planted. Uh, proper labeling requires seed testing, okay? And uh, without proof of testing, the potential for planting seed, uh, is potential for seed that might not germinate, or one of the things is very serious, and it might be contaminated with wheat seeds, wheat seeds. So buying seed that is not labeled by the North Dakota State Seed Department or wherever you are in your state is not a legal sale. Okay, so that's very important to know. Um, for certification, certification is a process to maintain and make available to the public high quality seed of crop cultivars, produce it, handle, and distribute it to ensure proper identity and genetic purity. Okay, that's, that's what the certification definition is. And a cultivar or variety is a product of a breeding program 
the has protection by the U.S. The has protection, and you can find them at the USDA ARS website or ARS Green Golf. If it's not on the list of varieties protected, then it's not a variety. Okay, and um, in cover crops we have many seed that is sold uh, and has germination and then sold as seed, uh, but it's not a variety. Okay. Okay. So we have the Plant Variety Protection Act or PVP of 1994, and this is what uh, is a federal protection for any intellectual property of seed, and uh, it's a 20-year protection. But this uh, PVP has a farmer safe seed clause. Okay, uh, seed uh, acquired legally that means um, uh, with the label and with the fees because it's a PVP variety can and may be saved by the farmers for their own, own use and indefinitely. That means if you buy it once legally, uh, whatever you have leftovers or you reproduce, you can use it again, okay? Um, this is for seeds that are hybrids, of course. The hybrid, uh, it wouldn't work the second time because it will, it will uh, you know, it, it, will, it won't be the same crop. It will be all different plants. It will segregate. But for all other crops, including cover crops, you can use the seed if you bought it legally, okay? Uh, just for your use, you cannot give it to your neighbors. Um, all seed that is protected by a PVP must be sold by variety name. That means you cannot change a protected PVP and sell it as variety not stated or VNS, okay? Uh, also, you cannot, a uh, buyer cannot divert to planting purposes, grain of a protected variety, which was purchased for a different use, like food, feed, or commercial grain. So if you bought seed of a crop to feed cattle, you cannot plant it uh, because that wasn't the purpose. So the PVP only affects seed that is intended for reproductive purposes. That means you're planting it to produce seed, okay? Somebody asked me before when I did this talk, is, um, uh, that's a discount um, for, for, let's say, if I plant a, a seed that I have and I use it for silage. Well, if you use it for silage, then you won't produce seed, okay? So you'll be able to use it once. So the different classes of certified seeds, we have breeder seed, uh, which is controlled by the breeder, and uh, whoever created that variety. Then it's foundation seed, which is the highest genetic purity from breeder or a seed lab previously certified as foundation seed, uh, controlled by the owner or licensee. Uh, register seed, which is produced from the foundation seed and the quality is suitable for production of certified seed. And finally, the certified seed, which is produced from foundation, register or certified seed, and two generations from foundation seed. And once this certified seed is produced, cannot be recertified. So seeds with a, without a PVP can be sold as variety, not stated, VNS, okay? But the sale is only legal if the seed has been properly tested, in this case, by the North Dakota State Seed Department, okay? Or any state seed department. And it has to have a label indicating germination and purity. Any seed with PVP, even if it's expired, I mean, it's after the 10 years, has to be sold by the variety name, okay? Uh, now, there's something we we'll call trademarks or brand names. A person can register a name of a, of a seed if it doesn't have a PVP um, and sell it by that brand name. And they, the, that brand name can be on the marketing products of the company, but it cannot be on the label. The label is only for varieties they have PVP. So trademarks or brand names, uh, they were used in many cover crops. A lot of cover crops are trademarks or brand names. These are not varieties, okay? And so they cannot be labeled as such. So, and, and there is a clause on the uh, legislation about seeds that says seeds shall not be labeled or advertised under a trademark or brand name in a manner that might create the impression that the trademark or brand name is the variety name. That's why it, it cannot be on the label, but it can be on the marketing uh, 
It came out of brand names. It's just a collection. Somebody has to see and clean it up and multiply it, but it's not a product of a breeding program. For example, in these some cover crops, example, I'm going to put radish as one of the examples. There's two registered varieties of uh, radish, daikon radish type, which are, they have PVP, which are grasa and silage radish. And, and some varieties can have both, a trademark and a PVP. Okay, so these ones have both. They have a trademark, the name. The trademark is the name of the variety. That means if you get a trademark of a, of a variety or, you know, uh, or a, you know, or a trademark or a, a brand name, what you're getting is that nobody can else can use that name. Okay, it's a, a it's a commercial, it's for marketing. So you have the trade name of the tillage radish variety. No one else can sell a radish called tillage radish. So when you're doing trademarking, you're buying the name, but that doesn't mean it's a protected variety. Okay. So grass and tillage radish, they have both. They are a PV, they have a PVP and they have a trademark. Now there's some varieties uh, of radish that you see in the box below um, that uh, that they don't have, they're not, they don't have a PVP. So these are trade names, so trademarks or brand names, okay? And so if they have a TM, that means a trademark, that means not, no one else can use, okay? Uh, I might be missing some of the TMs. I'm just putting this as an example. And if this is very common in cover crops. In cover crops, there's a lot of the seeds that sold, they are trademarks, not right. Now, um, so these ones are, what we call a large rooted selections of daikon type oil seed or forest radish, but they're not the product of a formal breeding program. That's the difference, okay? And rye, cereal rye, which is used a lot of cover crop, there are five varieties registered with PVP, including uh, the North Dakota Zealand variety, and I think there's a new one now coming out, which will have PVP too. And the hairy veg, there's four varieties that are registered. You can look for those varieties. So what's the risk of planting trademarks, right? If we wouldn't plant trademarks of VNS varieties, a lot of cover crops we wouldn't plant, okay? We use them. There are, you know, being a trademark or brand doesn't mean you cannot use it, okay? You still can buy that if it has the proper label from the state seed department. What are the risks of planting trademarks or brands? They can have high level of variability, okay? Which you don't know, some can go to seed very quickly. Some radishes can have an early bolting. Uh, they can have low seed link vigor, limited winter hardiness. For example, you buy a VNS variety from the south of winter rye, it might not survive the winter shift. Okay, the same with winter peas. Also, some of the seeds the strain market can have hard seeds and uh, noxious wheat seeds. Even if it's labeled, sometimes some seeds will be in there because uh, they might have not detected some of those noxious weeds. Um, the last one is one of the really important things, and we've had a lot of problems last year in North Dakota uh, with this, okay? Um, and I'll show you some, some ads from newspapers, uh, what was the problem. So the seed label must, this is where the seed label has to have. Name of crop of the variety, if it is a variety. No trained numbers of brands are allowed in the label. Okay. This is label, not what you have on the on the bag, like a marketing name. Uh, lot number ID, state of origin, percent of weight by all wheat seeds, noxious wheat present. Each state has different lists of noxious wheat. Percent of other crop seeds, percent of uh, inert matter, percent of germination, date of testing, name and address of who label the seed, and seed treatment event. So the seed. Big has to have this label with that information. Now, here I want to show what happened with noxious wheat seeds and cover crop seeds. Since 2019, unfortunately, uh, we found Palmer Amaranth. And if you look at these ads from different newspapers, you can see that Palmer Amaranth was found in millet fields, uh, CRP, um, and there's no one case. Also, in Minnesota, we found they found that. And so this is what happens when you're selling uh, 
uh, branded seed or DNA seed that even in my hot hot label, uh, some states uh, Palmer man might not be uh, might not be a, a noxious weed. Uh, so with ordering online, some people can order some seed online from a different state, and if Palmer is not an noxious weed there, it could get to our state, and this is what happened. Now we. Last year, we had a lot of fields with Palmer men, and a lot of them were millet. So they asked me right away, right away you know, a lot. You see where I put a circle is where it says cover crop seeds. You see the last two said cover crop seeds. So that's not good for those that we are really uh, interested in that farmers grow cover crops because of all the benefits to soil health. Uh, we want to keep this. Uh, we want people to do this because of soil health. And the great thing is the cover crops to the soil. But we want to make sure we don't do, we're careful because this is a problem. If we're bringing an noxious weed to a state where we didn't have it. Um, so, also, like I said, in CRP mixes, having found some noxious weed. In Palmer Mount is an example because it's not noxious in some states, so maybe that's how it came. And in South Dakota, it wasn't, it wasn't a noxious uh, weed. A week, weed, uh, until September 2009. Now it's in the list of noxious weed too. These were neighboring states. Sometimes farmers could get seeds from some neighbors in South Dakota, and that's the problem we're using. Uh, see, there's no regulated. So regulatory, there's different things, right? The violations they have fines, okay? And there's two aspects that might be satisfied when the violation occurs. Uh, one is the law and one is the variety owner's right, okay? All allegations uh, of violations are investigated. Uh, violating PVP in North Dakota, the fine is 10,000 per violation. And labeling violations, 500 to 1,000. Now this probably varies uh, between different states. Now these fines might not seem that high, but then you have whatever uh, outside of those penalties, you have the variety owner's the variety owner must recoup the research fees and what the damages and loss fees. So that can be a lot of money, okay? They can sue you for using a variety uh, that it was protected and selling it or planting it without having paid for it. Uh, both the seller of the seed and the conditioner are equally responsible. So um, companies that sell seed, they have to make sure with the same the PVP variety that includes the includes the, the value for those, so the fees for those. So prevent the idea of prevent violation is to educational and efforts like this. So a lot of people when um, incur into these violations many times is because they don't know. But like you know, for any law, not knowing doesn't excuse you from having to pay the fees <laughs> or the fines. Okay, so it's very important. Uh, to know and understand. So this is all I have for today. I know there's going to be a lot of questions, but I think we're going to do the questions at the end uh, once um, Mike talks too. So thanks so much, and uh, thanks for attending, and sorry about the troubles, but I knew I was going to be the first one. Something will happen. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. <laughs> thanks, Mary. Awesome. Thanks, Marisol. So, well, um, Marisol is um, stopping her screen share here, and Mike's getting his slides ready. Um, if you guys do have any questions and want to put them in the chat pod, you can do that. Um, otherwise, you can see that Miranda has added um, the recording will actually be available and where that'll be, and we'll put that up again at the end. So it looks like Mike's getting fired up here. So Mike is uh, Mike Osley is one of our uh, research agronomists at the Carrington Research Extension Center. And so Mike is going to go ahead today and talk about herbicide tolerance and cover crops. Uh, we, he's done some research on this and we've done some at the center. And so we thought it'd be good just to have him come in and talk a little bit about just some um, things to watch out for and think about. So Mike, do you want to take over? I'll make sure I can hear you and then I'll go back on mute. Okay, thanks. I have the uh, right screen up, don't I? You do. Okay, perfect. All right. Thank you everybody for uh, <clears throat> listening in today. So uh, I have a, a few different topics here I'm going to cover regarding uh, herbicide tolerance and cover crops. Essentially, I have it uh, split out into uh, 
uh, some slides about wheat, uh, herbicide use, soybean, and then uh, corn uh, to end with for as far as uh, different herbicide combinations that are going to be used for uh, each of those crops. So I guess especially since the group is from a broader audience um, than probably originally intended, which is great, um, it's probably even more important to uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the uh, factors that are going to influence herbicide breakdown and, and residual activity. Uh, first of all, for, for those out of state, um, I have a bunch of page references here to the uh, North Dakota Weed Control Guide. Uh, so that's what the abbreviation there is at the top. And so for those that have access to a weed control guide, uh, you can feel free to uh, either follow along a little bit or just reference it at a later date uh, because there's a lot more good information than uh, beyond what we can cover here. So uh, essentially there's a few things to keep in mind. Um, herbicide residual activity is not something that's easy to predict by any means. Uh, a few of the things that are going to influence how air and herbicide breaks down are things like sunlight, moisture, microbial activity or other chemical reactions in the soil. And uh, a lot of the times uh, the an herbicide breaks down more with just one of these uh, different components. Um, and uh, so for instance, you talk about the uh, yellow herbicides, your treflan, sonolan, uh, they break down very rapidly in sunlight, uh, but not so much with a lot of the other um, ways of, uh, of a breakdown. And so keep that in mind that every product you use is probably going to break down a little bit different from the next one. And a few other things more environmental related, I guess, uh, just rainfall. Uh, from year to year, you can have big changes even within a single site in how your herbicides are going to impact uh, cover crops, for instance, or other crop, rotational crops. Um, but uh, I guess the, the biggest thing is, in general, the more moisture you get, uh, the quicker the products are going to break down, again, as a generalization. Um, and this is certainly somewhat related to soil texture, uh, as well as um, the other, some of the things that go along with the soil texture, like uh, differences in pH or organic matter specifically. Um, and again, those change quite a lot within fields. So uh, the information I'm going to get to you, I think, is pretty broad. But um, just keep in mind that uh, within field, there can be a lot of variability. And so uh, what we're doing is trying to be conservative with our recommendations. So uh, as we go throughout here, I'm going to be referring a lot to risk. Because of the variability between sites and years, uh, we break things into three categories. Your cover crop is either going to be low, medium, or high risk based on the herbicide choice you made. And your risk might change uh, depending on, well, this year maybe we get more rain, so uh, you're maybe going to be more apt to take a risk. Or if it's a really dry year, prone to longer residuals, well, maybe you're going to uh, scale it back and, and, uh, and not do something that's a medium or high risk. And so the way we're doing the, the upcoming charts is that um, if we, we test everything in multiple environments, and if we had even one of our environments that um, flagged an herbicide cover crop combination as high risk, that's what the label is. Even if all other sites, we didn't see any problems, um, even if we had a problem in one site, we're going we're gonna to flag that as a higher risk category. And that is because, again, of the variability we can see in these combinations. We want to make sure people have the safest options available to them. So, uh, and then with that in mind, uh, we had, um, with the wheat uh, studies in particular, uh, we had uh, occasions where we didn't see any problems with any of our treatment combinations. So everything was safe, uh, but um, it, it, uh, it varies. And um, hopefully I can get some better pictures of this uh, photograph in the future, but 
uh, something to keep in mind too, when we're talking about soil residual activity, it's not always something that shows up right away. And I, I was just gonna point out that the longer the fall is, uh, and we're talking more or less about fall cover crops here, the, uh, the more likely you are to see injury. And what you see here are uh, in this picture are field peas uh, treated with the different rates of uh, stinger essentially. And um, essentially when they all, when the, all the peas started emerging, everything came up beautifully. Uh, but shortly after emergence, the highest rate we used, uh, the peas started shriveling. And then a few days later, the second highest rate, the peas started shriveling. And then a few days after that, the third highest rate caused the peas to shrivel. And by the end of the study, actually, all of the peas were showing a little bit of symptomology of the stinger. Um, even though in this picture, the uh, peas on the, the right-hand side look uh, pretty healthy. Yet. So just keep in mind that the bigger your cover crops get, uh, the more likely you are also to see um, some injury symptoms as you go. Okay, all that background being said, um, here is um, the most complete data we have from any of our cover crop herbicide work. Um, so this again is a situation where we're applying uh, the top end use rates for various products to a wheat crop. And then we plant a fall cover crop after harvest and uh, see the impacts of the herbicide on the cover crop. So this is not certainly not all inclusive, uh, no, nor is it for any of our other crops. Uh, we specifically chose products that could potentially have residual activity that we'd be worried about. So um, you can look through uh, here, I'm not gonna go through every combination, uh, but just note that we have uh, several combinations of a cover crop and a herbicide that we feel really comfortable with. Uh, and that are, that's the LR categories, that's low risk which means we saw less than 20% injury uh, during the fall from using these uh, herbicides. If something was labeled as medium risk, that means we saw um, injury that could be um, concerning. Uh, where we say anywhere from 20 to 50% injury, uh, which is usually stand loss, um, but there occasionally sometimes was encompassing also um, some uh, foliar symptoms as well. And then anything as HR is high risk, uh, which means anything more than 50% injury uh, to our cover crop. And so we have a few examples where we saw some pretty severe injury uh, trying to plant into um, um, uh, an area treated by these products. And the strike throughs uh, on, the, on those high risk groups means we saw significant damage more than one time. So for instance, our field P and wide match, one of the five sites we tested, uh, we saw a high risk response, but our lentils recorded two high risk responses to the wide match. So um, essentially I would just say never do that combination, right? Uh, whereas if you have something in that medium risk category, again, if you have conditions favorable to herbicide breakdown, I would say, um, and, and, and you're not 100% um, uh, set on growing your cover crop for a high yield, it's maybe as part of a mix, I would say it's probably okay to uh, use some of those cover crop mixtures. But again, um, if, you're, um, if you're feeling conservative, I would definitely go with one of the combinations that's low risk. Okay. And then for, for those looking for this information a little more, again, in the North Dakota Weed Control Guide, uh, you'll find this, not, it's not color, but uh, that same information on page 115. Okay, so uh, moving on to soybeans. Um, this research is actually conducted by uh, Greg Endress here um, at the Carrington Research Center. This database isn't complete. Uh, but I'll go over uh, just a little bit of what he's uh, found so far. And here the idea again is that we're going to be uh, planting a fall cover crop following our soybeans. And so we're looking at something that's roughly two to four months after uh, some of these herbicides were applied. So um, 
here's uh, some comments that we have in, right now in the weed control guide from some of the preliminary work. Um, you can go ahead and, and take a look at some of these combinations uh, for use in soybeans. Uh, this is pretty vague and was, I think, is more or less taken from the labels. Um, some of the, uh, I see he put animations in here. Um, but some of the more uh, current data is from 2018 and 2019, which was conducted in both uh, Carrington and Fargo. And um, uh, focusing on a lot of the pre-emerge products on soybeans, and then a, a couple of post options. And I know in 2020, we're gonna do this one more time with some um, additional post-emerge products. So uh, we had a pretty good fall last fall actually for this study um, uh, and the cover crops came up pretty nice. Um, here's what the data looks like. Uh, he's using a similar scale that we did in wheat where anything less than 20% injury we're saying is okay to use. If we had greater than 20% injury, we're gonna flag that and put that into a higher risk category. So in 2019, uh, we saw increased risk from uh, radishes with uh, Spartan as, um, as well as uh, Zidua and radish, uh, Metribuzin and radish, and also Metribuzin and turnip. So uh, again, we're seeing some potential issues with um, radish and turnips in both our soybean and uh, wheat programs potentially. So I know radish is a popular one. Uh, among a lot of cover crop mixtures. So just something to kind of keep in mind as we're going through. Uh, we're moving on um, a little bit, uh, essentially the same information, uh, but uh, just uh, written out here in a little bit um, clearer terms. So again, we're gonna have in 2020, a completed set of data for our soybeans, and we're gonna come up with a, a similar table that we did with our uh, wheat herbicides. So. Uh, moving on to corn here quickly, we'll, uh, in this case, um, uh, I think probably the most applicable cover crop use in corn that we'll be focusing on would be the uh, use of, uh, of cover crops mid-season into corn. Uh, so this is a picture of us last year planting our cover crops uh, into our corn uh, in early July. You can see the weeds are pretty well under control when we're planting here. So uh, we have a plan already in place. So we don't have a good set of testing yet in North Dakota uh, to check for herbicide sensitivity. Uh, so I'm gonna be pulling from a couple other uh, universities. So uh, this first table is from Penn State and they have a similar breakdown that we're using. Uh, instead of the high, low or medium risk, they just give the combinations a one, two or three uh, to indicate risk. Um, so uh, you can find this information out there if you search. I think I have the, uh, in the next slide, have the title. So again, same, same concept that we're looking at. Uh, they're planting their cover crops following these different product applications. And then some of these are flagged as uh, being higher risk than others. They have a pretty limited uh, cover crop set compared to what we might be looking to use, but still a few of the key ones are listed in here. So uh, the uh, here's the uh, title you might be looking for if you're gonna do a search, uh, improving the success of interseeding cover crops in corn. Um, here's a, a little bit different table that um, describes some of the herbicide active ingredients and in the products that contain them, as well as um, what grouping of species might be affected uh, by these different um, active ingredients. So again, just something you can kind of search through and peruse uh, maybe more on your own time. And um, then here's another one that's uh, probably even more relevant. So there's a difference here too. What I've been talking about mostly is just whether or not the cover crops are going to grow because of the herbicide residue. But on top of that, you also have to keep in mind, if you're grazing, there are also grazing restrictions on a lot of herbicides, okay? And so here's a publication from, from uh, Iowa State called, uh, at the top here, you can see it. It's called Herbicide Use May Restrict Grazing Options for Cover Crops. 
So if you search for that, uh, you'll come up with this publication that lists um, a number of, again, products. And um, what the label says is, a, is something that would be uh, either safe or not safe for grazing less than four months after application. So herbicide labels are really confusing. And um, uh, this is just a broad categorization. Um, some of these might have very short residuals, but everything here is just grouped into anything less than a four month grazing restriction uh, and whether or not um, it meets that, um, that four month restriction or not. And then in the, uh, the uh, last chart here I have, um, here's a list of products and, and combinations where uh, the establishment uh, is greater, or the, the grazing restriction is greater than four months after application. So uh, just some things to uh, keep in mind as you're going through and trying to plan your season is uh, you have not only herbicide tolerance problems to consider for growing the cover crop, but if you're grazing it, you also have to pay attention to these grazing restrictions. And then there's a more complete list of this as well. Uh, again, in the North Dakota Weed Control Guide, on page 125. So it's a lot to keep track of uh, when you're trying to incorporate these systems together, um, but um, it is definitely doable and we're trying to uh, keep filling in some of these knowledge gaps as we go, but acknowledging that there are still knowledge gaps for some of these products. So uh, with that, uh, that's what I have to share. Thank you, Mike. Um, so before we move into questions, we have a few questions for you, um, just to get a little bit of feedback on how you guys thought this webinar went. And if there's anything that we didn't capture in our don't didn't capture in our questions, feel free to put it in the chat box or email those comments to either Mary or I. So here is our first question, set of questions for you. And in the meantime, as you are filling those questions out, uh, we will, like I said, I'll be watching the chat pod. If you guys have any questions, we'd just appreciate if you'd type them in there. Um, otherwise, you can shoot me or Miranda an email. Um, that way, if a lot of you have the same questions, we can just ask Mike and Marisol once uh, to save time for them. <clears throat> And you guys answering these questions really help us to know whether or not this is effective, um, if this is a good use of our time and a good uh, way for you to spend your time. Um, so we really appreciate you answering these questions. If it's not, then we are going to have to change the format or find something new. So uh, you answering really helps us out. Yeah, and it helps us plan for future programming as well. We'll give you a few more seconds and then I will close this poll and start the next question, two questions for you. And just so folks know, um, these questions are anonymous. Uh, so don't feel like we're gonna look at your answers on the back end if you're like, oh, I don't want Mike to know. I didn't learn a stinking thing from him. Uh, I can pick on Mike. So um, don't feel like we're gonna go look at that. We can't, it actually just shows us anonymous and then then answer. So we have no clue how uh, things were answered. All right, I'm gonna end this one and we will start our next one. And it's looking like a little bit so This is on Mike's presentation to see um, what you guys learned from, from his talk. <clears throat> Looking like we have a question or two from Mike here coming in. So don't go anywhere. Do you want me to answer now or? 
Um, so you can start thinking about it. So it's uh, Marisol said she has a question for you. What about forage mixes and herbicides? Uh, so that's going to be something um, forage mix for grazing. How do I determine the restrictions on that? Okay, and I am going to give you a couple more seconds and I will close this poll. And then we'll um, maybe take a couple questions and do our last last couple of polls here. Okay, yeah, we'll open it up for a couple questions before we do our our last two polls for you. So Mike, any thoughts on uh, forage mix, grazing, how to determine those restrictions? Yeah, so I mean the, the tables are essentially designed best to use with a single crop setting, but yeah, of course most people are going to want to use a cover crop mixture, especially in a grazing scenario. So um, Naturally, the answer is that it's a lot more complicated, um, just like trying to calculate seeding rates with these uh, mixes. But uh, I know the uh, the Penn State article had um, some guidance in it about some of the uh, the mix forage mixtures and how the herbicide residuals might be impacting those mixtures. Again, they're a little more generic, just kind of grasses with brassicas, for instance. Um, but essentially, I would just say you kind of pick your mixtures based on uh, your program or vice versa, for that matter. Um, for In most cases, you're going to be able to find multiple cover crops that are going to be safe uh, for the uh, some of the different herbicide programs that are out there. So, um, you know, depending on how much of a percentage you have of your mixture, um, you know, it may depend on uh, some of the risk levels. You know, you're not going to uh, put a, or at least I wouldn't uh, put a lot of something that's a medium risk category in your cover crop mix. But you might include it as a a smaller component in there if you if you would like to have that in there. But it's not essential to have it, for instance. So, I guess you just have to kind of use your best judgment and and, and common sense when. Uh, trying to put together your your whole systems approach in this case. Okay, Marisol, did that answer your question? She said thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, does anybody else have questions? Are there other questions, um, either from Marisol or Mike's discussions, that you would like to ask? Uh, also note that if, you, um, if you're feeling shy and don't want to ask on here, if you think of something later, uh, you can always let us know. You can always email Miranda or I later um, or message us on our Livestock Extension Facebook page and we'll be happy to um, pass those along to either Marisol or Mike and get those answered for you. Uh, so if you do think of something later today, you can certainly let us know. I do have a slide up just saying, um, if you had any technical difficulties today getting on, I know I just um, got a phone call here from a person who's been trying to phone in uh, and they weren't sure how to do it correctly. And so um, they're, they're gonna hop on the Thursday one and I'm gonna send them the recording of today's. But if you guys had any technical difficulties getting on, if you wanna go ahead and put that in the chat pod for us, uh, that'll help us know what we can share with you next time. Um, Miranda's going to put up another um, poll here. These are super simple questions, again, just to check the usefulness of this. Um, so we know if this is useful or not. And do I need to stop sharing for you to do that, Miranda? No, no, but um, there's another question for Mike. Okay. Hey, Mike, I want to try 60 inch corn. Do I plan my herbicide for my wheat? population and tailored to my cover crop mix to fit herbicides used or other way around? Uh, well, that's a good question. I mean, I guess, um, you know, um, depending on what your strategy is and when you want to plant your cover crop uh, might change things a lot. Uh, again, here when we're trying the wide inch corn, we're looking at kind of a midsummer planting. And so uh, for me, 
I really want to make sure I get the weeds under control before I, I go in there with my cover crop. Um, uh, you know, and there are a number of corn residual products that are um, lend themselves to certain cover crop mixtures. So um, me personally, again, I would focus on the best uh, weed management program uh, for especially the wide row corn, uh, because if you fail to control those weeds um, and you have all that extra space there between your corn rows, uh, you could potentially be dealing with a lot of seed production. And, and me coming from a weed science background, maybe I'm biased like that. Um, but then I would try to build the uh, cover crop mixture around what what I can use to uh, control those weeds. But especially with corn, uh, there are an awful lot of options out there. And so, um, you know, maybe the program you've been using is more restrictive than um, something you can use uh, that would be also very effective at uh, controlling some of those weeds. So, I mean, I say it's a little bit of both anyway, whether or not you plan your herbicide or your cover crop plan first. But um, corn is probably more flexible than most of the other crops we have. Okay. <clears throat> and Chris, if you have any more of a follow-up um, or further on that question, you can again, go ahead and type it in here or um, we can always get you in contact with Mike as well. I'm gonna launch our next poll and well, you all think of some more questions. Well, this poll again just talks about the usefulness. Uh, was this useful or not? And don't feel afraid of hurting our feelings. Again, it's anonymous. I'm not going to know that uh, Joe was the one that said it wasn't. Uh, that way we, uh, we know how to keep going with our online format. And we just appreciate all of you. Um, first, those of you that asked us even to move it online. That was awesome. Um, and then sticking with us through this process. So we appreciate that. Yeah, we didn't know how this would go. This is definitely trial and error and learning for us, especially with the hands-on components we had planned. Um, so there's another question for Mike while um, folks are finishing up this poll question is, what are the most common cover crops are relative rank of the top cover crops mentioned and in what cropping systems rotations? I guess both Mike or Marisol would be. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I guess it, it really depends on where you're going. I, I think um, uh, certainly, it, yeah, it's a really difficult question to answer because I know a lot of people are doing a lot of different things out there, which is great. Um, you know, and, and a lot of it comes down to what's available in your area. Uh, you know, a lot of people might use oats or barley uh, because that's something that you can get for, for um, pretty inexpensively and a lot of people, at least in our area, might have some um, seed available, um, you know, but certainly I'd say one of the more commonly um, uh, commercialized ones is certainly the, the turnips and radishes uh, where you're probably going to be going more to a um, traditional or if you will cover crop or seed dealer uh, for those types of species. Uh, they're probably going to command a little bit more of a premium too, but um, Again, the preference there is just because they uh, they have very specific uses um, in, in what they're designed to do. I, it's a it's kind of a difficult question to answer, I guess. But um, yeah, I, I would like to add. Can you hear me? Um, yeah. I would like to add that um, Mary and I will have another of these webinars where we'll show the different crops and then talk about the importance. Usually when we talk about most common cover crops, we really want the, the farmers to choose their cover crops according to the objectives that they have. You know, everyone has different things, whether you want it for grazing or you want it for just soil health. Uh, different, uh, you know, in different crop rotations, whether you're planting them after wheat or you are inserting them into a corn soybean rotation. So crops are gonna vary a lot according to your objectives and your cropping systems or rotations. And so um, I think uh, I think it's, when he says Mary is a 16, 
April 16th, the other webinar? Yes. Uh, that we will do. And so I invite you to join that one too. We'll talk a little more about the cover crop species and which, you know, what are the functions and how you can select them according to that. If hopefully this helps. <laughs> Um, there's another question uh, in the chat box. Is there a concern planting sorghum sedan grass on ground that had a cover crop with fall rye? Mike, um, I can answer some. I, um, I've i seen uh, uh, sorghum sedan grass, depending on the conditions, can, um, can have problems at establishment of following rye. Okay. Uh, but just like in corn, it depends. Uh, it depends a little bit. Uh, it depends on how close to planting the sorghum sedan grass did you terminate the rye. Okay. The closer you get to the planting date of the sorghum sedan, the more chances you're going to have problems. They're both grasses, and just like from rye to corn, you can have some problems and cause some yellowing of the corn following. In this case, the sedan grass. There are different reasons for that. It can be it can be nitrogen immobilization. It can be um, some allelopathy, tox toxins. Uh, so in some some years, I've seen some some Sudan grass really really yellow and damaged after rye. Uh, but doesn't happen every year because it depends on the conditions, on the rain, on the moisture, uh, on nitrogen, uh, and many things. So, but that's a very good question and. I would have some caution of planting sorghum sudan right after fall rye. Although the sudan grass, since it's a forage and not for grain, it will you know, recover after two, three weeks, but then you're, it's going to delay probably uh, the production of forage for the summer and if that's what you want. <clears throat> okay, so we have a question from Alex. Um, he's planning on using an air seeder to plant soybeans on 15 inch centers. In between those rows, we'll be planting oats at 25 pounds per acre and rye at eight pounds per acre. Are there any concerns with, the, with that idea or is there anyone that has any experience with that? And while this question is being answered, I'm gonna launch our last poll too. Um, yeah, we've tried that um, a few times out here, at, at least with um, rye. We didn't um, really ever look at oats exactly. Um, with two years anyway, we've uh, planted uh, rye and um, soybeans at the same time. I don't know if you're talking about what kind of planting that you're talking about with your um, cereals, but we planted them at the same time in the spring and um, it's only, we've only had kind of mild success with that. It didn't, I don't think I saw anything with that system that was, um, in my opinion, that was uh, making it worth the extra effort to do that. But with, those are some really dry years on our part. Now, if you're talking about going in late season and planting those, um, you know, there's probably more merit to that, I, I, I think, especially with the rye in particular. But I don't know if Marisol has some feedback. Yeah, um, usually what we've done with cover crops, we've done it like after R4 stage. I don't know what you mean, uh, plant, uh, you mean planting the serving on standing dry? I I'm sorry, I don't quite understand if it's, it's you're good planting on dry coming from the fall or you're planting all this together to try to have a crop after soybean, or are you are, are you using this soybean for grazing? So, sorry, I, I'm not quite understand. What we've done with interseeding and soybean, we usually plant late in the season because soybean for grain produces too much shade. But if you're doing this mix all together, I would think, are you trying to graze this or, so or is like it preventive says, planting? Uh, these are all planted at the same time. Yep. But that, that wouldn't be for grain, right? If you're planting those rates, those three crops, rye, oats, and soybean at the same time, the soybean is not for grain, is it? Because if you do that, it, you will have a lot of competition. 
That's why I'm not sure that it's a mix that you're going to graze. Or if you're planting soybeans for grain, uh, you will have a lot of competition. So it says, oh, um, I see. yeah, uh, they would all be planted in the spring. The soybean oh, would be taken okay. for grain. The oats and rye would be terminated okay. mid to late June. And then okay, Abby, I, I understand. Yeah, that's, yeah. Okay. Yeah, in, yeah. In, that, in that case, I'm not sure if the rye would be adding much um, to that mix. No. Um, you know, maybe just uh, an oat, straight oat might be a little bit simpler in that case. Um, but yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. diversity is not the worst thing either there either, but, yeah. um, but I, I think- I understand it, now, so yeah. it would work. Yeah, I agree with you. The rye wouldn't work because it's a winter crop. So you plant it in the spring, it will just stay shallow. So it wouldn't make any sense. But the oats you can. You just have to make sure that you don't leave it long enough to produce competition. Because um, since uh, oats is going to be, a, a, you know, it's going to go fast. So it's not something we've tried. I don't think we've tried that. I don't know, Abby, uh, uh, you have a comment on that? Maybe you can put your mic up. Abby? Yeah, you know, yeah. I'll just, oh, sorry, I was just going to mention one thing quick too. The, I think uh, part of the reason I would say just oats is I, I don't think the rye would get big enough to uh, yep. uh, pr prevent a lot of the weed suppression. Um, you know, rye works pretty good doing that, but um, the more biomass it has, the better the weed control is. And so seedling rye, you know, for instance, isn't going to do much for mm -hmm. you you know, and that those oats might do a little bit better job of the weed suppression. Go ahead, Abby. Uh, um, so I think, I think a lot of this sounds like Franzen's work for the iron deficiency chlorosis that he was doing where they were planting oats along with soybean to help manage some of the moisture and the nitrogen and, and some of the, um, and directly the salts in those situations. And, and so I think there's, you could probably find it on Dave Franzen's webpage as far as the yield responses and what it meant uh, for those IDC reasons um, on Dave Franzen's webpage, and he's with NDSU. Uh, but I, that's, that's where I've seen that mostly. And then I made a comment in the chat box about um, where I saw some farmers where they had fertilized a PP field uh, for corn and they didn't, weren't able to get corn in there because of the timing. So they ended up putting in, um, they seeded soybean, but they also put wheat in between the rows because they were they wanted to make sure that they captured whatever nitrogen was there for the future, not planning on it being released the next year or the following year, but just to hold on to it for a little bit. And it, it looked really nice. We never got yields off of it because of the tight harvest, but um, well, challenging harvest, I guess it wasn't tight. It lasted forever. Um, but I, I think it looked nice. And I think it's something that they may try again on small acreage, but I think any of these things, if you're trying it the first time doing it on small acreage is a really good idea to get your, get an understanding of it, um, but, but that's just, that's my opinion. Okay, unless there's any additional questions, I think we're gonna wrap up for today. I want to remind everyone to, that our next webinar is Thursday at 11 and Kevin Sedovic, the, in, the rangeland Extension Specialist and the Interim Director at the, the Streeter Research Extension Center, our Central Grasslands Research Extension Center, will be joining anything else as well as Aaron Gobbler, who is the re a research technician at the Central Grasslands Research Extension Center. And they're going to be talking about some of the grazing cover crop research that's been done in the state and some of the implications of that research. Mary, is there any other reminders that you have? No, I think just if you guys do have any follow-up questions this week, uh, you can either bring them on Thursday and put them in the chat pod for us then and let us know and we'll get them to either Mike or Marisol, or you can always send either of us an email uh, and I'll just put that in here one more time just so that we all have that. Otherwise, I think we're good to go. Mm -hmm.